Well, I was talking with uh, with Chip Anderson yesterday about just uh, you know some of the things that uh, I've been writing about on my blog, Mindful Investor, and uh, on, on StockCharts.com. And one of the things that I keep coming back to, one of the themes I keep coming back to, is uh, the idea of discipline, having a disciplined uh, investment approach, a dif- uh, disciplined way of making decisions. And I find that so many times, uh, you know, humans by definition, by by design, are very emotional, and so we are. Uh, you know, sort of predestined uh, or, or pre-designed to make uh, emotional decisions. And, and in many ways, that has served us uh, very well. So what, what's funny is it's not a bad thing that, that humans are emotional. There's a lot, a lot of places where it's actually a very good thing uh, where, where we are able to make emotional decisions. And that whole, uh, you know, that, that whole decision-making process that we quickly uh, make, the fight or flight mechanism that kicks in, the anxiety, the stress, are all driven by you know humans trying to survive, and so that that whole emotional process is actually a good thing. Um, the problem is it can often get in the way of a good investment decision, and that's what I want to talk about here uh, today. Um, so there are places not just in investing where emotions can get in the way of good decisions, right? It, it sort of prevents us from making a rational decision or, or leads us towards irrationality. And as you probably have seen if you read my blog, I, I often come back to. Um, the idea of aviation. Um, I'm a student pilot, um, so Aaron and I have about 80 hours in an airplane, so I'm not I'm not ready to fly a 737 just yet, um, but I'm still learning. I have a lot more to learn as with uh, investing probably as well. But when you're, um, you know, if you think about it, any of you that have flown an airplane or that have been on an airplane and, and sort of see how a pilot operates it, what they don't do is, you know, sort of get ready, get a, get a game plan, and then walk out on the airplane, get in, fire up the propeller, fire up the engine, and then, and then take off. There's a lot of work that goes in uh, ahead of that. Uh, and, and what a lot of that is, is called is the pre-flight checklist or the pre-flight process. So, you know, I've often joked that going up for a one-hour flight is actually a five-hour experience, and it's very front-loaded because much of your time before you ever get a plane in the air is being thoroughly comfortable with how the plane is operating, um, you know, where you are going to go uh, physically and, and mentally where you need to be to prepare yourself for it. Thinking about emergency planning, an exit strategy, all these things that, you know, in the case of emergency, you've already thought a couple steps ahead and you have a good game plan in, in place. So before you tell the tower that you're ready for takeoff, you actually have done a number of things. And, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll show you in a, in a minute here some of the examples of the actual checklist I would I would use before I'm going up in the air. But the way I've, my, my wife at times has gotten, uh, you know, a little uncomfortable with me flying around in a little airplane in the in, in windy conditions. And I've always told her, um, you know, listen, honey, if you checked your car as thoroughly as I check an airplane before you would take it out, you probably wouldn't worry that much because I'm so confident in how everything is operating and that, you know, that I have an awareness of of how to operate every little piece of the uh, of the airplane. So, you know, those of you that have flown, this this might look uh, familiar, but those of you that haven't, um, you know, probably any, next time you get on a commercial airline or just look into the cockpit real quick, it's open, you know, as you're boarding and you'll see them, you know, with paper checklists or electronic checklists and, and you know, touching a lot of knobs and, you know, pointing things and identifying them. And that, you know, from the most sophisticated airliners to the, the tiniest little, um, you know, sport aircraft, uh, you have a very thorough process of checking all the systems and again, preparing mentally for what you're about to do. So on a Cessna 172R, which is the airplane that I've flown uh, most of the time, which is a pretty standard uh, sort of training airplane, uh, you know, single engine uh, propeller plane. Um, before, this is the the moment in the checklist of about 100 odd, you know, individual items that you're doing. Um, when you get to this point, this is when you've, uh, you know, uh, getting ready to actually fire up the propeller for the first time. So you've walked around the airplane, you've physically touched every piece of the plane, the rudders, the um you know, the, the flaps and, and just confirming everything is where it needs to be. And then this is the moment right before you actually fire up the propeller, which can be a little dangerous because you need to, need to just make sure that, you know, it's the first time you're actually um, making the engine work. So at this point in the checklist, the first thing you do is check the master switch, which basically just makes sure that the, the airplane is going to get the power it needs. You turn the beacon on, which is an emergency transmitter. Um, you open the throttle a quarter inch, which is just, you know, giving you just a little bit of, uh, of, uh, of momentum. You don't really want to do anything too crazy. Mixture idle cutoff is, is the fuel to air mixture going into, um, into the engine. And then the fuel pump is off because you don't need it when you're, uh, when, you're, when you're priming things. And then the very next thing you do is you yell out the window, you know, prop or something like that. And then you fire up the propeller. And if you've done the, uh, the first 50 checks, okay, then it comes on just as, uh, as expected. And you, and you kind of go from there. Now, that is a pretty stress-free moment in your process because you're sitting on the ground, 
you know, as long as there are no birds or people nearby the airplane, it's relatively safe. There's very low chance of anything happening. So let's go to maybe a more stressful moment, which is maybe more realistic for a lot of the investment decisions that you try to make. And it's funny that the, the physical experiences that you get in the airplane are very similar to the physical experiences you'll get when a position goes against you or the market, you know, moves in an, an unexpected direction. So one of the favorite things uh, for your flight instructor to do when you're flying around um, in an airplane is to yank out the throttle, meaning, you know, just basically uh, recreate the conditions for an engine cutout, meaning you've lost your engine. And they say, all right, you've lost your engine. What do you do? Now, I will tell you from experience, the very first time they do this, you panic and you, you feel your uh, heart rate increase. You feel your heart up in your throat. You, you know, you start sweating because you're like, oh, my gosh, this, this doesn't feel good. And part of why they actually do it is so you feel the physical sensations and you you learn how to minimize those and also how to still make good rational decisions in the face of a stressful environment. So in the case of an engine cutout with the plane that I'm talking about, it you know it's sort of a figure seven on the uh, on the dashboard. You start with the left, go over and then go down and or, or sorry start at the bottom and, and go up into the left. And so here are the steps that you would actually take. First, you set your airspeed for maximum glide, meaning you know you make sure that you can you know get the airplane as far as you need. So in that airplane, it's 65 knots. Fuel shutout valve means um, you basically, um, you know, you might have cut uh, fuel to the engine. You make sure that's not the case. F mixture rich, which means maximum fuel from, um, you know, into the engine. Fuel selector valve to both means you're bringing it from both of your wings, which is where they store the fuel. And then finally, you check the ignition. And 95% of the time, one of those five things will correct the issue. A lot of times, like your knee will knock the key out of the ignition and turn it off accidentally. So by following those, you're taught you know, to, to sort of address it. Now, the first time I had to do this, I was shaking. I'm, you know, I'm trying to do this and the instructor's there to make sure I'm safe, but sort of trying to go through those steps. The very last time I remember doing this, I'm, you know, you're sort of half yawning. Oh, okay. And you're just kind of going through the motions, but up, but up, but up, but up, but up. Yep. It's fine. And, and the reason why they get you to that point is they want you to be able to make a decision, which is not fed by emotions, but fed by rational processes. And then it's not affected by the stressful environment, the physical conditions that you're experiencing. Now, the reason why I give you a lot of detail about those things is I think as you, as I explain that sensation of being in an airplane when your engine cuts out, you probably have experienced a similar condition if you've traded and have had a position, um, you know, in the red or, you, you know, you've, you've put a position on and then the market just goes completely against it. It doesn't feel good physically. You tend to have a physical reaction to that, right? You, you get uncomfortable, you, you're sweating, you're seeing a lot of red on your screen, doesn't feel good, but you still have to make a good investment decision, even you know, regardless of how you're feeling. So, what I coach my my clients, and I, I spend a lot of time working with uh, financial advisors and institutional investors, helping them make better uh, investment decisions using charts, using using visualizations. And what we uh, always talk about is their process for making a decision using technical analysis. So, just like on an airplane, you have a checklist, and that's not a suggested checklist. That's not a maybe if you think of it, you can go through these steps. That is, you have not earned the right to get this plane in the air unless you followed these steps one by one and have physically confirmed that you've done it. So it's funny as investors, as traders, we often consider checklists more of a nice to have, more of a guideline and less of a, this is something I absolutely need to do. And I will tell you that when I'm coaching you know, uh, novice investors or, or uh, junior analysts in, in my former career, uh, my former uh, positions, um, I have actually physically made them write out the answers to these questions. You will answer these questions on the checklist and then you have earned the right to tell me whether you're bullish or bearish on this chart. So what I want to do with the remainder of our time this morning is sort of share my technical checklist. This is the way that I have over my career developed my process for looking at a chart and coming to a decision. Um, this is not by any means the right answer. I don't think there is a right answer. Um, the right answer is whatever checklist is going to be in line with your process, your investment horizon, your strategy, what assets you're trading, your time horizon, all those sorts of things. So, you know, don't take this as, as the right answer. This is, you know, this is what I found at this point to be my right answer, but, you know, I'm always trying to reevaluate it. So this is how I go about my process. When I'm looking at a chart for the first time and someone says, what do you think of Google or what do you think of Facebook or um, Johnson & Johnson? I basically bring up this checklist and at this point I sort of do it mentally and I go through these steps. So very quickly, and I'll, I'll talk you through each of these and then I'll show you a couple uh, examples using using some uh, current charts to sort of explain how we translate it. And if you, it, it's funny, as you hear these steps that I'm taking as uh, Tom and as Aaron were talking about some of the charts earlier in the show, you will find that either they articulated or you know that they are going through their own process, their own mental checklist for making sure that they're looking at all the inputs that they need to. 
So first, for me, is Dow theory. The very first thing we, I want to understand is what is the price doing, right? And it's so funny. So many times we jump to an indicator or jump to volume or jump to news or something. But for me, the very first thing, before I can make any evaluation of a chart, I want to know very simply, is this stock in an uptrend or a downtrend? And if we skip that step, we are skipping probably the most important piece of information to start with. So Dow theory, if, you, if you've studied your, your technical analysis or you, you know charts, it basically is you know, an uptrend is a series of higher highs and higher lows. A downtrend is a series of lower lows and lower highs. And so the idea of Dow theory is just defining are the highs getting higher, are the lows getting lower? And that is the first thing that we want to answer. The second thing then is looking at trend line. So now that we've defined what the trend is, actu is actually doing, are there any lines that we can draw that will sort of quantify visually what that trend is, how quickly it is rising or how quickly it is selling off? Because that'll give us you know, an initial uh, exit strategy for that current trend, or it'll tell us when that trend may be reversing, when the trend is no longer our friend. The third item uh, for me is moving averages. So now that we've looked at the price, let's take the noise out of the, out of the picture. Let's smooth out the price, so looking at a 50-day, 200-day, maybe exponential moving averages, and just try to look at the overall trend from a, you know, from a, from a, from a, um, you know, over time and see how that trend has evolved. Where are we at relative to where we've been historically? The fourth item in my list is pattern, right? So are there any key patterns, a head and shoulders pattern, a pennant pattern, a cup and handle, any, any of those things that you may, have, uh, you may have heard of. And again, just to give you some visual guidelines with which to analyze the price. The third item, uh, support and resistance. So um, are we near any significant support or resistance levels? I'd include things like Fibonacci retracements in here as well, just to identify, are there any key price levels that I may want to understand? You know, the trend reaches this price and I want to revisit it. To finish out my list, I have confirmation and I put anything other than price itself in the confirmation category. So RSI, PPO, on balance volume, any of those things that would help qualify or disqualify my analysis of the trend would go in that bucket number six. And then finally, relative strength. And this is, I, I would argue, one of the most important things as an equity investor. And many times I've found individuals um, you know, miss this key step. Um, institutions are very used to it because this is how they tend to be evaluated. But you want to look at how this chart relates to all the other charts that you could be looking at. And a lot of times this will help answer the question, am I looking at the right chart in the first place? A lot of times you, you make great, you know, a great analysis of this chart, but it turns out you're not really where the opportunity is. And that's where relative strength can tell you. you know, if this stock looks, the chart looks good, but it's just a market performer, there are other stocks that are probably doing much better and others that are doing much worse, and those could provide better opportunities. So this is what, and again, this is the checklist that I've evolved over my career, and, and it's not, it won't be the same 10 years from now, and it's different than it was 10 years ago. Um, but it is, at this point, what I found is a, is a great routine for me to follow. And if I answer those seven questions effectively, I feel very comfortable at the end of that process saying, and therefore, I am bullish, bearish, or neutral on this chart, or, or this is what I think my position should be. So with that checklist in mind, let's look at a couple different, you know, real examples. These are um, charts I just took a snapshot of uh, earlier today um, and just go through this checklist together just so you can see how we might want to go through it. And again, what, what, I'll, what I'll tell you before we get to this example is, um, you know, my, my previous role, we actually did uh, psychological studies. We looked at novice technical analysts, people who are just learning the toolkit, maybe just reading uh, uh, John Murphy's book on it and, you know, really, really early on. So they, they've seen a chart before, but not very comfortable. And if you look at this chart of, uh, of Alphabet here of Google, you know, this might be what their visual process was. And we actually wired them up and, and used an eye tracker device to see where they looked on the chart and how much time they spent in each location. And what a novice uh, technical analyst did was their visuals were kind of all over the place. They would look at this entire sort of section in the top and look at all of the price, might look at the moving averages and kind of glance around it, then look down at the RSI and sort of look at the shape of this. And then they might look at the relative strength. And, and what, what we found looking at different configurations, whatever we put on the screen that people tended to uh, look at, but their visuals were pretty spread out and it took them a long time. So on average, it took them a minute or two to do all the analysis. The more experienced technical analysts, these are people that had 10 to 30 plus years of experience looking at charts every day. Number one, it took them about two to three seconds to look at that same chart and make a decision. And their, their eyes were focused on a couple really key areas. They would first look at the price and look at this general area and see where we are relative to moving averages and support and resistance. They would glance down to the two indicators and look at the current levels, briefly glance to the left, and that was it. Now, it's not to imply that their process was not as rigorous. I would argue it was even more rigorous. It was just very systematic and very consistent. 
what was funny is when we would talk to people afterwards and say, what, you know, well, what, how did you make that decision? How did you come to that decision? The novice and, you know, technical analysts would go through this, you know, extensive discussion of all these things. The more senior analysts actually would quickly say, yep, this is a buy. And then they would be able to fill in all the details. Well, here it's in an uptrend. It does this, it does this. So they were very quickly visually able to identify it. And as you get further along in your journey of understanding charts and using technical indicators, hopefully you get closer and closer to that point where a lot of this is a mental process. It's automated, it's disciplined, but it still you know, has, some, has some structure to it. It's not unstructured. So let's go through this checklist very quickly relative to these, uh, this chart, and then we'll look at another one uh, and, and just go through the. So the first question is, Dow theory, is this stock in an uptrend or downtrend? And following the simple Dow theory definition and the time frame, I'm showing you a, a one-year daily chart of uh, Alphabet. I'm seeing a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. So by the classic Charles Dow definition 100 odd years ago, the stock is in an uptrend, undeniable in my opinion. The second, are there any trend lines we can use to quantify that uptrend visually? So I'm connecting the low from uh, the Christmas Eve low, which is when many uh, stocks bottomed as well as the overall market, connecting it to the lows in February. That lines up very well from the low uh, a couple of days ago. And I can now track this uptrend in an uptrend. You just need to use the lows because you want to know when the uptrend is no longer happening. So overall, I have this trend line now to visually quantify this, this uptrend. As long as we remain above that line, I would say we're, we're still in an uptrend. Third, moving averages. What are the overall moving averages doing and where are we at relative to those? Overall, I see the price is above two upward sloping moving averages. Ideally, it would be the price, then the 50-day, then the 200-day. But overall, the price above two upward sloping moving averages, I have you know, have yet to find a, a company that goes bankrupt with that configuration. So overall, this is pretty healthy from a moving average perspective. Fourth is pattern. Are there any key patterns we want to pay attention to? And what's interesting is, you know, I'm finding sort of this, you know, it's not a head and shoulders pattern, but I, it feels bottoming to me, right, of, of lower lows and then higher lows. I see that transition and breaking above, you know, a level of resistance, maybe a, a big base breakout, I might call that. But I'm actually drawn to this pattern right here, which is a con, uh, consolidation pattern. Uh, after a big uptrend, we have lower highs, higher lows. Uh, anyone listening, can you remember what that pattern is called? It is a pennant pattern, right? Where you have a, a big uptrend and then a consolidation period. And when that breaks out, that tends to continue. And the measurement is usually that entry point kind of measures to the previous high. So overall pattern is pretty constructive. Support and resistance levels. Well, we hit the Fibonacci resistance level here just above 1170. Uh, this is using the high from the end of July of last year, the low from December 24th. That was a pretty good resistance level to pay attention to. We pulled back to the uh, 200 day moving average and now we closed above. This is, uh, you know, uh, earlier we closed above that uh, Fibonacci level. So overall, I think we're above that uh, resistance level. So I'm, my eye is now drawn to that next one, which I've in, identified with this a uh, horizontal sort of pink uh, dashed line. Finally, confirmation. What are any indicators telling us the RSI has been sloping upwards, not yet overbought, which suggests to me that, you know, the stock could have a little more to go. And I'm also drawn by this bullish divergence of lower lows and higher lows in the RSI. And finally, relative strength. Now I'm looking at the very bottom, looking at Alphabet versus all the other stocks in the US that might want to do, close to making a new relative high and breaking above a trend line if I connect the recent uh, peaks. So now I have completed my checklist from is this stock going up or down all the way to all those different pieces of evidence. Now, you know, together we've gone through this. I think you can see that overall, in my opinion, based on my checklist, the weight of the evidence is bullish and, and Alphabet is, is in a good uptrend into a proven otherwise. Let's now look at a maybe less constructive example and go through the same checklist. This is uh, F5 Networks, FFIV, um, you know, gap down and, and, you know, obviously a pretty, pretty heavy down day, which, I've, you know, I've, I've taken a, a, a stock that's on a pretty good downtrend as an example. But let's go through this checklist again. Don't just look at the chart and make a decision. Go through the checklist just like we did before. So first, Dow Theory. What are the highs and lows doing here? I would argue we have a pattern of lower lows and we are arguably now at a new closing lower low here today. And, you know, are we making lower highs? And in this case, I think both of those are happening. So now we're in a Dow theory downtrend instead of an uptrend. What are any trend lines doing? Well, I didn't draw this trend line here, but you could see if you connected the highs, this was actually a pretty frustrating one because we broke above that trend line, but failed and came back down. And, I, and one of my, my mentors um, uh, used to tell me that there's, there's nothing more bearish than a failed breakout and there's nothing more um, bullish than a, and then a failed breakdown. And that's sort of what we've seen, a trend line breakout that immediately reversed. You, you, you're whipsawed, you get, you get stopped out of a long position, and now um, you know, the trend line has failed. So at this point, I might take a trend line using the more recent highs to quantify this downtrend. 
moving averages. I now have a stock trading below two downward sloping moving averages. That is the opposite of an uptrend. That's more of a downtrend pattern. I don't know if I really see a pattern here that I would I would I would argue. So at this point, I think it's pretty uh, pretty non-existent. That's one where I, I don't think you know if you if you uh, you know everything's a nail if you're holding a hammer. So I I don't want to just look for a pattern. I want to see if something jumps out of the screen. I mean, I'm not necessarily seeing that here. Finally, support and resistance. This is key for F5 because I would argue we've just gotten down to these uh, lows around 150 to 151 and you know, a number of times that served as support. So we're right potentially at a key support level. If we break down and confirm that, I would certainly would, would want to avoid it more than uh, be there. Confirmation, what are any indicators? I'm just showing one indicator just to simplify. I would normally look at maybe some other things, but you know, the RSI is just in the oversold region. That is a, a, a piece of information I'd want to be aware of because a number of times, obviously, you know, the, the RSI becoming oversold suggests a short-term bounce potentially. Relative strength, this thing has been underperforming and has really accelerated lower um, as a lot of stocks have, has, have recovered while F5 has gone lower. So now I would argue the weight of the evidence in this case is, is more negative, right? So we have a downtrend, uh, you know, down, uh, downward sloping trend lines below moving averages, uh, you know, right at support. Um, you know, I would say in terms of confirmation, we're right at the point where I might expect a short term bounce. But overall, I find an underperform and this is something I would want to avoid. So hey, that hey. is how you would tend to go through that process for those two charts. Uh, so just to wrap up my my presentation here on uh, on discipline using checklists is, uh, you know, one of my first mentors in the industry told me to always be a student of the markets. And with my students, when I taught technical analysis at Brandeis University, I've also lectured at uh, Harvard. I'm, I'm actually going to uh, Babson in, in Boston in a couple of weeks. And, and anytime I speak to students, I always tell them, you know, my, my one of my final arguments is always be a student of the markets. And what one of the things that drew me to this profession was the fact that the first meeting I ever went to, which was an old MTA meeting in New York City, um, one of the most, you know, elder statesmen in the audience raised his hand and asked a question of the presenter. And I'm thinking, wow, this is someone who's invested for, you know, probably 50 years and he's still learning and asking questions like this is a place where I could grow my entire career. And I, I think many of you probably listening will find that that's the case for you, too, even if it's a, a hobby or a, it's your side hustle or it's your thing that you enjoy doing, you know, when you're not working. It, it's it's a place where you can grow personally and professionally, which I think is, is pretty fascinating. So when you're creating your own checklist, again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to suggest that my uh, checklist is the answer. It's my answer. And I think you need to develop your own answer. So how do you do that? How do you develop what's on your checklist? Here are just some ideas that I've, I've done uh, and, and that I would suggest you. Number one is look at the blogs on stockcharts.com. So you know, I, I write on there and, and, and Tom, Aaron put some great content. Uh, people like Arthur Hill, Greg Schnell often will show you in, you know, sort of under the hood on how they're coming to a decision and things that make sense to you that resonate with you, ideas that click with you. Put that sort of, you know, pencil that in on your checklist. And as you build it, you'll find that that is something you can always come back to. Second thing is chart school is have a great, great educational resources on, on stock charts. And I, I think that uh, will help you understand some of the different indicators. And one of the most important things there is having a differentiated checklist. So if you just have a checklist with all similar indicators, you're not really doing it. You, you see on my checklist, they're kind of different things. And that's what's important. Uh, Stock Charts TV, things like Market Watchers Live are, are fantastic. You guys do such a great job of explaining how in, and just listening to how you're describing a chart. You can pick up on what your mental checklist is. And so things that you know Tom, Aaron, other guests are, are saying I think are great to pencil in. Um, the predefined scans. So on Stock Charts, great screen, screening capabilities, uh, including some scans that show you some of the signals that others have found helpful. So if you find scans that tend to surface ideas that you like, put those in your, in your checklist. Uh, obviously, there's tons of, of well-written books by you know by a number of the contributors on on stock chart, but but elsewhere. And so, ideas, examples that that resonate with you, put them on your list. The most important one out of all these is your experience. And I would say, if you create a checklist today, if it's the same five, ten years from now, you have fumbled a huge opportunity to improve and grow as an investor, as a trader. So, you know, your checklist should be a starting point, and you're welcome to use pieces of mine as your starting point. But remember that as a starting point, and it, and it, there is no ending point. I think you know people like Carl and and John Murphy and Martin Pring and others that have been doing this for years and years are still sort of learning and, and, and learning from different market conditions and how they need to evolve what they're doing. So I hope this has been interesting just, just to talk through, you know, how to think about discipline. If, if this sort of idea, these, these mental 
uh, blocks and, and mental fixes to try and help you think more clearly about your process. If this resonates with you, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, I read a blog on stock charts called The Mindful Investor. I try to pick apart some of these themes and, uh, and on a regular basis share ideas like this to help bring more rational behavior, more discipline to your investment process. And I hope you'll you'll uh, you'll check it out. And at this point, now, Tom Aaron, thanks again so much for having me on. Always a pleasure to join you guys. Great, great presentation, but you can't leave yet because we have questions. Of course. <laughs> um, so if question came in uh, and uh, the question was asking how critical volume is in your analysis. So when you're looking at those individual charts, say when you're looking at Google and you get the breakout, do you pay attention to volume or are you just looking at price? That is such a funny question and, and I'm a great question, but it's funny because Chip Anderson, the founder of StockCharts.com, asked me that exact question yesterday when we were <laughs> going through a chart together, just going through some things. He's like, where's volume on your, on your charts? I'm like, oh, man. Um, you know, John Murphy is cringing in, in New Jersey, I think. Uh, but, you know, listen, where, where is it in my process? I bucket volume along with uh, where I had confirmation on my list, number six of the seven steps. For me, volume is part of those. And I, I to be completely honest, I very rarely look at just volume. I do pay attention to on balance volume uh, just as a way to smooth out the volume over time. And I'm looking for agreement or disagreement. You know, it's a stock appreciating with you know, appreciating volume, that would be one of the data points. So I showed a simplistic chart in general. There are a number of indicators that I sort of consider confirmation and volume with certain assets can be very, very helpful for, for sort of gauging that direction. So fair, fair question. All right. Another question. Um, and that maybe you can bring up that Google chart again, but the question mm -hmm. was, that was the example used was Google. But if you did not have to buy today, if you're looking back at this chart, where would have been, where would you have said the best buy signal would have been on this Google chart? I mean, obviously we have it now, but is there some point in that, in your analysis there where you just said, hey, Google, this is the time I should be jumping into Google? Yeah, Tom, obviously December 24th, that I picked the bottom. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice, right? If life worked like that. And it doesn't. And people that tell you that's the case, they are probably not being 100% honest with you. It is very hard to catch that sort of move. So, you know, where, where would you have found it? And, and to be honest, when I'm coaching investors, and I, I do a lot of coaching advisors just thinking about their investment process. And what, what I do is draw a chart like this and, and think where during this period, where would you be comfortable buying the stock. Now, certain investors love buying beaten down names. They buy something like Alphabet when it is cratering, you know, they buy when no one else would want to. Um, and in which case, you know, looking at something like RSI and trying to capture that might might have been helpful. For me, I'm a little more um, a little more patient and I tend to be a little more conservative and I tend to like things that have reversed. So, you know, if you think about when would this checklist have turned more constructive, it's clearly pretty positive now because we have an established uptrend. You know, so for me, one of the big things is when we finally start to have this higher low, you know, the beginning of January, and then we continue to break above that next swing high, that's when something like this would pop on my radar. I probably wouldn't be comfortable buying it until we get to these points where we're breaking above Fibonacci levels. This is the level where I probably feel comfortable buying this type of, of, uh, of stock. And if you look at the checklist, that's where some of these things would have, you know, turned positive. We're breaking above resistance um, instead of just setting levels and never touching them. You know, you're st starting to find little continuation patterns, little, you know, flag patterns as you rally and then consolidate and then keep breaking out, um, you know, starting to outperform a little bit, right? Coming, uh, coming in this period and really not until the end, you really see an improvement as, as, uh, as Google's kind of rallied out there. So the, the checklist slowly turns positive during this um, during this uh, period and also breaking above the moving averages. It was pretty helpful. So when we finally broke above the 50 day and retested it and came off of it, those are the types of places where I probably feel more comfortable uh, buying it. But your question implies a really good point, which is you should make sure that, you know, the checklist for me is good because that's how I'm, I'm trying to be a trend follower. So I'm not going to buy until an, an uptrend is established. You might be more of a contrarian, in which case your, your checklist probably should look very different because you're trying to capture things that are, you know, bottoming out earlier in the in the uh, in the in the reversal. So make sure that it's in line with how you're trying to actually win the game. Well, this was a sensational session. Uh, I'm going to throw the sensational word out there. That was great, Dave. That's a rare sensational vote. I appreciate it, Tom. Oh, yeah. Oh, listen, always a pleasure to join you guys. I I, I enjoy participating in this and and even more enjoy uh, watching it. So thanks for what you're doing. Oh, and uh, we're going to have you back soon. Sounds great. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, thanks again and enjoy your stay out there in Seattle.